Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this very special evening. I have a wonderful colleague and friend whom I have known for many years, Nitin Paranspe. And Nitin, in celebrating your presence today, we celebrate the best of Indian talent, which is now into a global context. I think Unilever has always been known to source top talent from India, and it has been one of the pioneers in uh, leveraging Indian talent globally. So we are extremely proud as an Indian, it gives me great uh, joy to see you in the kind of role you play in Unilever's. And what a celebration it was for us when you actually got the position and you know, you and your family must have been happy, but a lot of us were happy for that event that took place. So, you know, thank you very much, Nitin, for coming here today and congratulations for a wonderful life that you have led so far. Thank you, thank you, Anil. Thank you for having me. It's been, an, it's a privilege and an honor. Thank you. Nitin, um, you know, one of my favorite questions that I always start on every Thursday evening while we do these sessions is to understand from your life so far, your own version of your life story when you say it to yourself, what were some of the things that you did along with your teams over the years that when you think of those, you still think there was something very special you did, something which made you and your colleagues extraordinarily happy, and something that you ended up doing together, which you are extremely proud of, and gives you a lot of happiness. Wow, I guess, uh, I think that's a great question, because uh, even, as you, uh, even as you were asking the question, I could uh, begin to think of uh, a few times in your life, Hmm. Where, um, where you feel incredibly fulfilled, you feel incredibly proud. And um, uh, for me, the two occasions that come to my mind uh, are both linked with an extreme form of adversity that uh, my team and I were, were having to deal with. The first one goes back quite a long time ago, I was relatively young in the company, just nine or 10 years in the company. And I'd gone down to, uh, I was made the uh, branch manager of Chennai. And um, having gone there, um, just when I thought that it was, it was a dream job for me at that point in time. And uh, within a short period of time, uh, we had the situation where the company uh, faced uh, a boycott boycott from retailers across uh, Kerala. It was, I think, in uh, 1997. And uh, dealing with that boycott with a large proportion of your sales coming to a standstill uh, was nightmarish for me. But what stood out for me were one or two things. The, um, the incredible amount of trust and empowerment which I experienced at that point in time. This, uh, it was a large enough boycott that it started impacting the sales of the company overall. And the chairman of the company at that point in time would call me up quite often. And I think he realized quickly when he called me so the second or the third time that I would be feeling the pressure. And uh, at which point he said something I'll never forget. He says, Nitin, I call you every time, not so that you are under pressure but to let you know that uh, you enjoy everyone's trust and that you're the man on the ground and everyone else in the company will go by what you recommend. Yeah. And in that one action, uh, I think he raised my level of responsibility and how I felt about that situation um, by orders of magnitude. And then there was something else he said in his first interaction with me. He says, Significant as this issue is, I want you to remember one thing, that we will always take a principled stand. And if it means we, will, we have to walk out of the state, we will walk out, but we will never succumb and we will never give in on our values. In that one moment, he did many things that I felt proud about because he said that this was the time our values were tested. And in that one act, he demonstrated that this company really believed in those. And that was a massive lesson for me. And as I started narrating these stories to my team, I saw a team which was so energized because everyone felt proud working for a company which was so principled, working for a company which wanted to do what was right and not take any shortcuts. 
and the energy that I saw in the team doing things well beyond their call of duty. Yeah, was uh, I'd never experienced things like that. So the first time I remember, uh, I felt as, as if I was um, uh, on a constant adrenaline boost. I could work for 18 hours in a day and still uh, have a spring in my step and not feel tired was uh, around that time because we were fighting for what we thought and believed in was a just cause for a larger purpose. And uh, that felt incredibly, we felt incredibly proud. So that was the first one. The other one was much, much later, another adversity. After I became the CEO of the Indian company, and at a time when I felt uh, it, was, it was a dream come true, it was like a honeymoon period for me after becoming the CEO. But as I've said before, we all know honeymoons don't last forever. Uh, but honeymoons don't always end in a nightmare. Uh, mine did because we had the global financial crisis that took place within months of my taking over the CEO. And uh, it was the most traumatic period that I was going through. And at that moment, I don't know why, but uh, I remembered uh, a chance interaction that I had with the late professor C.K. Prahlad uh, almost 10 years ago at that stage. And I remembered his story, which I had been incredibly inspired by, but I'm ashamed to say I'd forgotten about it. And uh, with my back to the wall, when I was reminded of that story, uh, I said, what the hell? Let's try and see what sounded good in theory. Does it actually work in practice? And uh, with that, it allowed me over the next few years to carry out some experiments, human experiments. Uh, and um, it's a long story, but uh, I, have, I have been just taken aback to see how, uh, how in the right conditions, the same set of people, how magic gets unleashed, different juices get created, and um, um, how teams can go on to do things that even, even each one of us as individuals did not believe we had the capacity to deal with and do. So um, a long answer to your very simple uh, question, but uh, both these examples were rooted in adversity. One of them was, was when I was inspired by uh, how my leaders and the chairman of the company responded to me and how it made me feel and act in a certain manner. And the second one was uh, uh, a life-changing experience that I had with Professor C.K. Prahlad and the opportunity then to put some of those uh, lessons into practice and what that resulted in. How oh, wonderful. You know, can you talk a bit more about this Dr. C.K. Prahlad and its impact on you? Because you and I talked about it a few days back also. I mean, it seems like something very special that happened. So can you just describe a little bit more and to how you process that input, how it came back to you and what enabled you to be at your best? So, you know, the encounter was actually quite uh, almost innocuous. Uh, it was in 1999 or 2000, Professor C.K. Prahlad was on the board of Hindustan Unilever and he uh, uh, had taken it upon himself to mentor a few, uh, few young managers. I was still considered young in those days. And uh, I had a chance to meet him and he asked a very simple question, which is, what do you think, Nitin, this company needs more of to be a to be an even more special company. And I was young and I was quick to respond. I said, we must be more entrepreneurial. So I said, what does that mean? So I gave him the usual ones about take more risk and be bolder, et cetera, et cetera. But nothing satisfied him. And he went to a flip chart, which was behind and he wrote two alphabets, A and R. And he once again in the row below that, once again wrote A and R and looked at me as if this should explain everything and it meant nothing. And he dragged it out for a long time as a good professor would do teasing me along the way. But in the first row, he wrote A less than or equal to R. And in the row below, he wrote A substantially greater than R. And uh, I'll cut the long story short. He said, A less than or equal to R is a manager and a managerial mindset and A substantially greater than R is an entrepreneur. And he went said, the only difference between a manager and an entrepreneur is the relationship between these two alphabets, A and R, where A stood for ambition or aspiration and R stood for resource. 
And a managerial mindset, he said, is one where ambition is equal to resource. We are all taught as managers, as he said, managers manage resources. So when you are talking to someone in a managerial mindset, the conversation often goes as follows. If you tell someone that you're reducing his resource, he says, reduce my target. If I say, I'll give you more marketing support, he says, okay, I can sell a little more. So there is this equality between ambition and resource, which defines a managerial mindset. And then he went on to say that an entrepreneur has no correlation between ambition and resource. And he is happy to live with this inequality, to live in his mind. And it is the inequality between ambition and resource, which is the driver of innovation. Wow. And therefore the person lives with this thought and the longer he lives with this thought, one fine day you find he or she finds an answer a new way of using that resource, a new way of using that resource such that this inequality suddenly is not an inequality anymore. Ambition yeah. becomes equal to resource and that's the innovation. Yeah. And a great entrepreneur, once he's done that, changes the ambition again. Yeah. So you constantly live with a mismatch and only mindsets which have the capacity not to feel burdened and being shafted with the mismatch yeah. are able to be entrepreneurial. That oh, really was what he said. How wonderful, how wonderful. What department are you? You're in innovation? How can a necessary condition for innovation is a mismatch? If you can't live with the mismatch, you can't innovate. Now he said this, I heard this and I said, wow, he's a great professor, but I was very impressed and uh, professors are, well, they come up with these wonderful frameworks. And I was impressed and I went back and I'm ashamed to say that I did not do anything about it for eight or nine years. Yeah. Wow. And nine years later, in this global financial crisis, when the world seemed to have been caving in and I was feeling terrible about myself, it wasn't as if my boss was breathing down my neck, but I was feeling I was letting down the organization which had such hopes. And that day I learned something, that falling in your own eyes is worse than falling in your boss's eyes. That's how I was feeling. Right. And in that moment, I don't know why, sometimes serendipity has a role to play. And I don't know why this, I, this interaction with Professor Prahlad came back to my mind. And I wanted to see whether this actually works because there was no normal thing I could do at that moment, yes. which solved the problem. And uh, I wanted to see what does audacity mean? What would be a boldly audacious goal beyond the realms of imagination? Mm. And uh, we chose an area around distribution and expansion and took a number, I don't even want to go there, but it is so wildly off. I'm almost embarrassed to mention it because it seems so, uh, so stupid even mentioning it. But I don't know why, but I did. Yeah. And in that moment, I might have, um, I might have burnt a lot of the equity that I built in the company. And many of them would have said, you know, this is what happens when you become a senior manager. You <laughs> know, that's the reality. Yeah. <laughs> But there was one thing going. I had a leadership team which felt as bad about the company not performing as I did. They would have given anything for this company to do well. Yes. And the conversation I was having with them is, you know what? Yeah, it seems impossible, but why would we not give it a shot? How would it feel to try and do things yes. that no one in the world has attempted before? Yeah. And yes. that... That mood created conditions and I was just staggered. I was staggered to see within months yes. outcomes which were unreal. And yes. it troubled me. I have to say it troubled me to see that because I could not explain yes. how come the same people yes. were busting their guts even earlier. What has suddenly happened to have this sort of magical outcomes come in within months? And it troubled me till I called, found an answer. Yes. The answer simply was that usually, I'll give you an example. Let's assume we were adding 25,000 outlets in a year. And yes. that was great. And if I'd said to my sales director that we want to add 50,000 outlets, yes. he would have looked at me and said, are you nuts? He would have shown me my last five years numbers and yes. said, if you added more than 25, 30, you would have never That's right. me. He would have agreed to a number of 35 or 40 and he would have convinced me that that number was a super stretch target. 
That's how normal. <laughs> and he would not have been wrong. No. She yes. would not have been wrong because yes. he never done anything more. And then the number I started off for was not fifty thousand. I started off with five hundred thousand. When every year we used to do twenty five. Yeah. Yeah. And that number was so wide. Yeah. The one thing it did was it did not it did not lead to any negotiation. Because what <laughs> can you negotiate? Four hundred thousand, three hundred thousand, four hundred and three hundred thousand is as stupid as five hundred thousand. Yes, yes. So the one thing it did was no negotiation, yes. and it allowed for a different conversation to take place. Yes. The conversation was how will we feel going behind that number? Nobody expected to hit it. Yes. Nobody expected to hit five hundred thousand. Yes. It was just the pursuit of things that no one had tried before. Yes. Wow. And then I asked myself, why do people negotiate? Why does that thing happen? Yes. The only reason is fifty thousand. They expect they are expected to hit the number. So if he didn't hit that fifty, he's a failure. She's yeah. a failure, and we are all afraid of failing. Yeah. And that's what prevents us from dreaming big. And that's what creates the self-limiting things of thirty-five, forty. And we convince ourselves that yeah. that is a stretch. At five hundred thousand, no one expected to get there. Even if that hit a hundred thousand, we were all heroes. At two hundred thousand, we were all heroes. Yes, I think. i learned one big big lesson and that big lesson was that all of us go through our lives so afraid of failing that we don't even explore the depth of the capability that exists in all of us and if you can liberate yourself and if leaders can create conditions where you are not afraid to fail that you are not working towards conventional targets but your targets are things that make you feel proud yeah that's the emotion that's what you work towards magic can happen beyond what any of us is imagine yeah wonderful you know i recall the time fondly because we were working with you in unilevers at that time just before that time when we were doing that work on coaching and i also used to hear from my colleagues uh, when you were given that innovation category and you were trying to make things happen in a market which had kind of slowed down and so we have very fond memories of the conversations that i and my team were sourcing out of the work that you people were doing and it had special i have to ask you another question here in all this work that you did what did you discover in yourself because they say the most profound knowledge is self knowledge and what did you learn about things that you do exceptionally well that you ought to value yourself to leverage it in the future so what gifts did you discover in your own self during this kind of work you know um some of this work was going on around the period as you mentioned when the company was slowing down there was a lot of change which was happening i had just come back from london uh, i was new in my role and uh, in a way um i experienced in that period my first failure real failure uh, i keep saying in my life if i was to summarize 30 years of work experience i would say it was one glorious failure one chance encounter with professor pralad and one serious adversity which allowed me to carry out human experiments and those would be really the three defining moments in my career but that failure which i went through taught me many things first that uh, with all humility i would say the first 15 years were quite successful i hadn't failed and that had made me a little complacent yeah and uh, i um, am sorry to say that um, uh, i lost sight i lost sight on the consumer i lost sight on the real issues that matter i was trying to be too cute too clever and um, and it wasn't working and i was feeling terrible i was spending sleepless nights i reached a stage where i would wake up at 3 and 4 in the morning simply not knowing what to do um it was possibly the time when i had my most period of self doubt in myself at that moment and maybe at that stage you know it's sad to say but it was at that moment after exhausting every other alternative i went back to my core core to who i am and it reminded me of a belief system with which i had grown up with but i had forgotten for an 18 month period which was when you do the right things 
the right outcomes must follow. To me, it is like a law. I often say like, it's like gravity. When you drop something, it falls down every time. So also, if you do the right things, the right outcomes will follow. And when this thought came to me at uh, 4, 4.30 in the morning, one morning, that's saying, listen, the issue is not that complicated. I'm making it more complicated. I'm not confronting the real issue. It's staring at me. I'm not choosing to do it. Hmm. Why? Because it felt expensive. It felt difficult. Let's just do the right things. Hmm. And um, when I started doing that, I started seeing results come. And those results were much more sustainable. They were more long lasting. And I'm embarrassed to say that um, it took me that long to realize something that I have believed in. And since then I have said to myself, in the end, you know what? Don't get taken in by everything else around you. We don't run a business which is too complicated. Our business is relatively simple. This is not rocket science. If we stay true, look at the consumer, understand the needs, the answers are often staring at us. Just do the right things and play for the long term. Even if it seems expensive at this moment, the cheapest that issue will be is now. The longer you wait, the more expensive it becomes. What a nice thing to say, you know, because uh, I often say this to myself. If you postpone the difficult things, including a difficult conversation with yourself, it will turn ugly. That is so true. That is so, so true. And so one has to really face the discomfort in the moment that is happening and all the pain in the moment rather than try to postpone it. <clears throat> one has to really, as you said, go back. And I think I'm so glad that you're saying you have to trust your own self to say there is a fair way and the right way to do business. It is absolutely correct. And, and, and someone might do that. What a nice thing to say. There is another thing I want to ask you, given the current context that is going on in the current uh, circumstances. This challenge, some people say that uh, in a way we should have always been prepared for it, but that kind of hindsight. Some others are saying that this requires some extraordinary leadership effort on the part of the collective, not one individual. For example, one of the researcher analysts reported a person of eminence reported that India's GDP may reduce by 10% this year. I mean, this is like the worst estimate I've seen somebody come out, but the person had his reasons. And then there are all these huge problems of small businesses who don't have enough cash and so on and so forth, right? So in this very, very challenging environment, what is being revealed to you on the size and the magnitude of this challenge and what are you, for example, being inspired to do in your responsible position in Unilever? To leverage your own strengths to lead the company through these difficult times. And also, therefore, what is your guidance, especially for all the young people in this channel today, on how should they be thinking about this challenge and responding to this challenge? So firstly, uh, uh, I have to say that... Uh, um, I could not have imagined we would be sitting in the world like this just a few months ago and how uh, virtually overnight the world came to a standstill and we were having conversations that we could not have imagined before. Uh, causing discomfort, getting everyone into a zone of the unknown. So I don't claim and profess to have uh, uh, definitive answers to all of this because I remember when we got into the space, as a leadership team, we would have meetings every day, uh, come together as a group, half an hour, one hour, keep talking about what do we do? How do we deal with this as new things were being thrown at us from different areas? And uh, we had a few principles to fall back on. Hmm. And uh, I learned a few things. And one of our principles was that we will come what may, we will protect our people first. Hmm. And number two, that we run a multi-stakeholder biz model and not a model which is maximizing value for one stakeholder, which is the shareholder. We've prided ourselves about running the company in a certain manner. And uh, we realized very quickly that it was uh, easy to say that in good times, 
the real test of our belief in the philosophy of running the business was in challenging times. And uh, in these times when you don't know, when you're thrown up with many questions and you've never had prior experience, your values guide you. Your values guide you and help you determine between right and wrong because there is no playbook. There is no prior experience. You're dealing with new things up front every time. And as we started dealing with this, we simply had to, thankfully, as a leadership team, we have a shared set of beliefs. We spend a lot of time talking about this. We even spent time, thankfully for us, 12 or 18 months ago, as we were having a, the CEO succession, new teams coming in, we sat down and spent days with each other, crafting a paragraph and where we could all sign up to and say, this is the philosophy that I can sign up to. It gives me energy to get up every morning and commit to this. And because we have invested so much time in understanding each other, the values and our beliefs, at times like this, we could say, go back to what we believe in. And you know what? When you do that, frankly, each one of us, what's right and what's wrong becomes relatively easy. If we have the clarity and the touchstone of our value system to go against. And that helped us more than any economic modeling that we could have done at that stage. Yes, and the other day you were telling me that you just by chance came to India and then for the last three and a half months you are now in your apartment in Mumbai and doing this global role effortlessly and that everybody is working from home and all the work is getting done and you also said that uh, with the blessings of everybody and the good wish that Unilever has, the company Touchwood is doing well. Did I, did I understand that correctly? So I think I would, uh, firstly, it's uh, many positives uh, out of this terrible event that uh, society is going through COVID. On a lighter note, I would say that uh, I don't recollect when I've slept in the same bed for a period as long as this. I would be traveling every week. I don't think I've had the opportunity of being with the family and uh, uh, it's been a blessing in that sense, even as we are dealing with this issue but it has taught me something else. The human spirit, the resilience that people have, how people across the world have adapted. And it's also taught me one more thing, how we can go through our lives with some self-limiting beliefs of what can happen and what can't happen and what you can do and what you can't do. If someone has said to me, you can run a business like this, that we can close our financial books, that we can run our SNOP meetings, that we can launch new products, that we can innovate and collaborate, which can set up new, uh, identify new parties, find new customers, all of this with everyone sitting at home across the world, I would have said, you must be nuts. Yeah. And yet all of that has happened. What does it say to me is not just about this. It gets me to reflect what other self-limiting beliefs that I might be having today, which, uh, and why do I have to wait for a crisis for me to question some of those? And uh, because with every one of those, you liberate yourself and you create new degrees of freedom for yourself. And, uh, you know, there was uh, a, another remarkable encounter that I had with uh, a remarkable blind person, Miles Hilton Barber. Uh, he's the most inspiring person I'd met. And in one of my conversations with him, he said something and he asked the group, when was the last time you experienced something for the first time? He said, that was the last time you grew. Hmm. And uh, pushing people into new zones of discomfort. And most of us don't do that. And uh, that line has stayed with me. When was the last time you did something for the first time? That was the last time you grew. That's another way of saying we have to experiment. We have to try new things. And I think COVID has forced us to try new things and many good things have come out of it. Very nice. I'll ask a last question from my side and then I'll encourage everybody in the audience has already started putting a large number of questions. So last question to my side. Nitin, if there is something you look at the story of your life and you are still very young compared to what people are talking about in terms of, you know, people are talking about 65 being the new mid-age and 70 being young and, you know, 80 being a new career and things like that, new language. 
in the story that is still waiting to be told in your own life, what are things which are coming to you on what is giving you purpose and meaning to your own life? And what would you like your future life to unravel? What is it that are some things that you, you are dreaming about and things that are important to you? So I can talk about what is important for me, but I have never planned my career. I've always felt that sometimes we spend too much time thinking and planning and plotting how your future should be. And I've often said to young managers and young people who come in, yeah, that the best way to make sure you get ahead is to focus and do a great job at what you are given today. Good as you are, you're not that good that with half your mind focused and planning your career somewhere else and only half your mind focused on the job which you're given today, you will do a better job than someone who's 100% of his time, energy and focus is on today's job. Yeah. So I, this is not to say you shouldn't have a broad idea of what you like, etc. But don't obsess too much about the future is how I think about it. Uh, what drives me? What uh, in a strange sort of way, ever since I was growing up and I grew up in India and most people in India would understand, I think I grew up seeing, and I remember one conversation with my friends when we walked out of some moral science class and someone said, oh, this is rubbish. Honesty is the best policy and things like that, which we are taught is rubbish. I said, why, what? Saying, look how many crooked people are getting ahead. Hmm. And something happened in me and I, it said to me, why do you have to be crooked to get ahead? Why, why do good guys have to come last? Yeah. And why is it not possible that you can live your life with simple, good middle class values of decency, of respect, of fairness, of equity, and yet demonstrate that all of this can be congruent and go hand in hand with delivering exceptional outcomes in terms of whatever you choose to do. And I don't know whether this is real or not, but in a strange way, I'm a little idealistic. I'd like to believe it is possible. I'd like to believe it is there. And I'd, Wonderful. in a weird way, I'd like to reject everything that proves or disproves this and only look for reinforcing evidence in my life at least. You know, I remember many years back when I invited you for a seminar of All India Management Association, you reminded me that you were a young man graduating from Pune Engineering College I had probably met for the first time when I had visited your campus and we were looking for talent for Aisha. That's correct. And uh, you know, Nathan, then when you reminded me, I was, I was reminded of that. And you know, what you just said, in some respects, Nathan, you are the same person that always has been, which means I do not know whether to congratulate your parents or your teachers or everybody who contributed to shaping your worldview. But what a wonderful thing to say that, you know, if you lead your life based on some sound, good old human values and do the right thing for right people, eventually that is what life is all about, isn't it? That's, that's how you're saying it. That At least for me, I think. And um, yeah, I just hope that I have the capacity to keep, uh, uh, I keep saying, uh, I'd rather remain this uh, naive optimist all my life. Wonderful. Uh, than Wonderful. become uh, overly uh, uh, influenced by things around me because that a little bit of naiveness and a yeah. lot of optimism is uh, the sort of recipe I'd like to read in. Yeah. You know, now I'll open it up to people. So Prasad Subramanyam, who's a batchmate of uh, Vindi Banga from IM Ahmedabad. And he, you know, also is a visiting teacher <coughs> and marketing. He ran his own advertising company. So he's talking about uh, some comments. He says, first of all, getting out of your comfort space is to attain excellence. He said, A.R. Rahman said to him once that he pushes his singers to always sing at half an octave higher in layman terms, at a higher pitch to bring your voice from unexplored depth. So that's one comment he makes. But he also made a comment earlier about um, about what he was seeing in, and he was congratulating you for that uh, insight from T.K. Prahlad. And so here is a question. In the God of Small Things, Arundhati Roy dwells on how her uncle made her lose her fear of failure. By rewarding her to fail in her exams. So, 
you talk a little bit more about how can you celebrate this failure and learn out of it and put it to good use? Can you talk a bit more of that? I can and uh, failure, by the way, I've learned more out of my failure than uh, which I talked about 2002, two, three, than in many other situations. I tend to, however, use different words when I talk about failure. Uh, I like, I, well, I'd like uh, to, to encourage people to win and feel good about winning, but to use for everyone, or many people certainly would understand cricket. And uh, I'd use the phrase, that if you want to hit the ball out of the park, yeah, you have to be, you have to leave the crease. And when you leave the crease, you have to be prepared to get out. Yes. So if you want to win big time, you must be okay to fail. If you are too afraid of failing, you will play within yourselves. You will never do anything which is special. So the way I see this is, uh, I would celebrate learning out of that failure. Failure, if you keep failing in the same thing again and again, that's no good. Mm. But if you're too scared of failing, that's no good as well because you'd never do anything exceptional. So leave your crease and uh, otherwise you don't have a chance of hitting the ball out of the park. Uh, Sneha Yadav, one of our young students in soil, she is asking, what are some of your beliefs and values? which might have guided you through your journey of being an amazing leader. Part of it you've already answered, but would you like to articulate some of your beliefs and values which have got the best out of you? You know, it's difficult for me to, uh, um, it's difficult for me to say more than what I have uh, said thus far. Um, other than saying I have had the opportunity to uh, work with so many wonderful leaders. And I saw one thing that all of them were very different. Yeah. And it taught me one thing that there is no one cookie cutter model of leadership that exists. And um, I've always felt that there is a necessary condition for leadership. And I hope I'm able to retain that. And uh, that is, that is authenticity. Yeah, I don't want, I don't think I would ever want to follow someone who was inauthentic. It would simply not inspire me. It would not give me confidence. I would not feel that I could trust them. Yeah. So authenticity, I think is a necessary condition. I don't think being authentic will make you a leader, but I can guarantee you not being authentic is certain that you will never be a leader. Yeah. So your best chance is to be yourself. And the second thing I would say is leaders actually are, have a point of view. So be, don't be afraid of expressing a point of view. Having a point of view once again doesn't guarantee that you're a leader. You become a leader if that point of view is different. It's inspiring. It, uh, it makes people say, wow, that's good. And people then want to follow. I don't think great leaders become great leaders because they seek followers. Yeah. They become great leaders because they follow their beliefs. Great leaders are the best followers, followers of their belief system, their conviction. I narrate a story. If you give me 30 seconds, I would say all of us know Mahatma Gandhi. And one thing I've always wondered is what might have happened when he set out for the Dandi March and a day later, he discovered that there was no one else walking behind him. Would he have stopped? Or was he the sort of person who would have walked and tried to make salt alone? And for, I just feel he would have gone and done it all alone. And I suspect most people would have seen him like that. And because they saw in this man, a person with such conviction, such belief that it inspired awe and it inspired following. And that's why he had hundreds of thousands of people following him because he was willing to follow his belief system irrespective of anything else. So I would say to everyone, I don't know whether I can ever be like that, but I'd say, have a point of view and be authentic to yourself. Don't know whether you'll become a leader, but you'll be true and that's your best chance. Yeah, wonderful. Raul Jam, who heads the fashion the business of Aditya Birla Group and is the CEO for that business, 
he wants to ask a question what were your key learning during the global recession when you became the ceo of hindustan unilever and which of those learnings would you recommend to sustain even during a normal economic scenario so my uh, had i not failed in 2002 and 2003 i would have been wholly incompetent to deal with the 2008 2009 period and i'm glad i failed on a smaller stage before i reached that and all the lessons at that point in time which is confront the issue the cheapest it will be is now uh, etc were helping me and i had a great team and i was a little more and i had a great boss who had trust in me um, and that helped me at that stage and i would say to everyone at this moment as well that as we are likely as most people predict that the world is likely to face a recession as a result of covid yeah we i would only say one thing be relentless in your focus on the consumer hmm don't get taken in by internal conversation that is going in this is the time to be more externally oriented not internally focused and in difficult times the role of a leader is not to make their teams feel inadequate and hopeless there have been times when i felt that i never enjoyed the trust of my boss and you know any way when you go through a tough time people are feeling terrible about themselves they are not sure whether they can win so if you are a boss of people your job is to instill belief your job is to instill hope because a person who doesn't see hope has no chance of winning there is no chance of winning a war with self doubt so in a recession be focused on the consumer do the right things don't take shortcuts there are no shortcuts for long term success hard as it might seem do it right and last i would say trust your team if you're feeling bad a good team is possibly feeling worse that they are letting you down yeah and uh, therefore don't doubt them and uh, give them hope and belief uh, satish shanoy who is asking a question he is saying nitin if god gave you one hour extra a day what is it that you would do in that one hour Ha, having read a book more recently which has been quite transformational and i would recommend it to everyone i would say at this moment i would sleep one hour more yeah i read a book called why we sleep yes i have to say it has changed the way i think i used okay. to pride at my ability to manage with less sleep my ability to handle jet lag and travel all over the place and be sharp but uh, i have, i think i was misguided Uh, i would like to get a slightly better balance between how much i sleep uh, i think i will be more productive more effective uh, so i would uh, encourage each one of you to sleep one hour more i would like to build on what nitin said because in that one hour your brain actually grows new cells that is correct that is the reason uh, it's yes. a remarkable book for you to it's, yes, it's yes. just eye opening Yes, and it improves your learning capacity. Quite apart from your physical well-being, it improves your learning capacity and your power of being more creative and innovative. So, what a wonderful answer! Thank you. And you know, one of our other students now she is asking the question, Shivani Bhatnagar. What is the one quality you look for in a candidate to make sure he or she? is really the kind of raw material that unilever's holistic and sustainable approach to business would fit well with what's the one thing you would look for in the ideal candidate for unilever i would say two i'll talk yes. about two allow me to mention two so, first the hunger to make a difference yeah to make a real difference and two that's the what and the second one is where is this hunger directed what's your belief system those are the two things i would look for do you have the desire to make a difference and that hunger and how is it directed is it self serving or is the desire to make a difference consistent with unilever's values of running a multi stakeholder model serving society and demonstrating that a business can make a difference to society while running a great business so one is the what and where is it directed that's how i would i would say increasingly that's my focus because there are plenty of people who know enough about enough things and the rate at which things are changing 
frankly that doesn't matter because it is irrelevant very soon so you need the hunger to learn the hunger to make a difference and thank hopefully directed in the right space based on a belief system and a character and a value system which is consistent with unilevers green sethi is asking a question that how did you manage your team in a way that they did not stay afraid of failure and they worked with the same enthusiasm can you talk about the way you led your team i don't know by the way i don't uh, it's difficult for me to uh, answer that probably some of my team members could uh, could give a better answer to that but you know a little bit of it i was fortunate when i first was facing this i had a certain bank balance that was developed over the years and a relationship and a credibility that i had built if you go around with a completely new bunch of people where there is no equity that has been created and overnight i said you are doing 50000 out or 25 and you are going to go and try and do 500000 they would say this guy is nuts and you would lose everyone so there was a little bit of good fortune and there's also a certain judgment that you need to exercise in terms of when is the time right for you to explore different strategies at that moment that's i think one number two i think people sense a degree of authenticity as well i think people sense it when you really mean it you can't fake it every day you can fake it once you can't fake it twice so when people sense that you are talking about things which are and you are yourself are excited about trying new things excited about new stuff um it becomes apparent and i think i think good ideas good energy is also infectious and using the language that i have uh, of covid that all of us understand the are not of that infectious positive energy can also be very high i've always prided myself in trying to do two thing not prided i think i've set myself goal i fail many times by the way in that objective that when you have an interaction with a person you have to leave the person with two feelings irrespective of what has happened you have to find a way to raise the bar if you are satisfied with what's come it's not good enough because it stems with my belief that everyone's capable of doing more but you also have to leave the person with a belief that he or she can do more and they must want to do more yeah that's right if they go back feeling that they've been that this boss never is a pressure whatever you do you are unhappy and you're always getting beaten that's not good enough and yet if you're satisfied with what everyone's come with you're not being a good boss so i feel a boss must leave people behind with only three things first a vision that people want to make it live it must collectively resonate but must be individually relatable everyone in the company must be able to relate to the vision second whether you like it or not as a leader you have to have this conscious mismatch create that mismatch between ambition and resource whether people like it or not if you don't create that mismatch you're doing disservice to your people because you're not creating conditions that will allow people to do heroic things every person wants to be a hero yeah we have to create conditions that will allow people to be heroic for that a mismatch between ambition and resources is a necessary condition and the third thing is these two are not enough you have to create a culture and a way where you instill belief and hope every leader must instill belief and hope when people sense that your leader believes in you you different things can happen so but no doing one of these three is not enough all three simultaneously if you are able to do good outcomes happen i try i fail more often than i succeed but my goal often is to see how i can do all three together wonderful uh you know ratna pande who's a dear friend and a colleague she also wrote a wonderful book on short stories recently she says that in hindsight if there was one thing nitin that you could do differently what would that be oh in uh, hindsight maybe as uh, in my when my children were small and we were uh, i might have it might sound really uh, strange to you but if there was uh, the thought that comes to my mind just now is if we could have uh, insisted 
and found a way to make a, a dinner with everyone together every evening, a, a sort of a ritual that we could have gotten ourselves into. I would have quite liked that. Uh, we miss doing it. We justified it on me being busy, my wife work, the children doing different things, and we never created uh, a sort of family ritual where we all come together, spend an hour over dinner, allowing conversations of different types that would happen, create a different bonding. And ever since I've been to the UK over the last five years, I have seen many of the Western families make that, irrespective of what's going on, uh, quite an important part of their uh, family, even if they can't manage every day, it might be two days of the week, it might be three days of the week, but they follow it with religious uh, regularity. And uh, it might sound small, but at my stage, as my children have grown up and moved on, maybe if I could do one thing differently, this might have been it. Dr. Anil Khandelwal, who was uh, the former chairman of Bank of Baroda and has been an amazing leader himself, he says, uh, Nitin, do you think leadership is largely acquired by observing and experiencing great leaders? Or is there any other way to learn about leadership? I think you can observe all you want. But, uh, well, basically, I don't have an answer. I don't know. I'm not an expert on leadership. I can share with you my perspective. I think and my perspective is many people read, many people observe that that is only 10% of what happens. What you do with what you observe, how much reflection goes in. To my mind, reflection is more important than the act of reading. Reading gives you information, reflection on what you've read, reflection on what you've observed is what, and uh, filtering it through your belief system, your thinking, allowing multiple perspectives to collide with each other to form your model and then having the courage to experiment with it. It's observing is a bit like standing behind the nets and observing Sachin Tendulkar or Virat Kohli bat. You can get all the theory you want, but you have to put on your pads and get onto the screen on the pitch for you to figure out what's happened and make your own mistakes. Absolutely. Wonderful. You know, I, I chair the Chinmaya Vidyalaya School, which has about 1800 children here since I'm a trustee of Chinmaya Mission. And one of the teachers of the high school, Alka Rohil, she says, you know, unemployment, sickness, financial struggle, losses, everybody is experiencing hardship. And you may have experienced some of that in your global role. And uh, Nathan, you are in a position to make a global difference because you are in Unilever's you are the global chief operating officer. So with your perspective of a global kind, how do you help people to stay hopeful in different countries, different geographies in such a tough situation? Is there anything you should do to motivate your friends and family? So, you know, oh, as Unilever, we, um, um, we have been thinking quite hard about the space and what is the future of work and what's likely to happen, not just because of COVID. And um, we, for us, purpose is at the heart of many things that we do. What is our corporate purpose, but what is also our individual purpose? And helping individuals uh, try and answer that questions for themselves is an important aspect of what we do. We run workshops. We want almost 160,000 of our Unilever employees all going through the world through a structured program which helps people to identify what matters to them, what gives them joy, what would they like to do. And because many of us go through life feeling that we are trapped into a certain path, this is where we are, with concerns, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I think the more we have started doing this, the more we have allowed people to surface the things that they want. And then we help people through training, through reskilling, through upskilling, through allowing people opportunities to change track in terms of what they want to do. And sometimes people at that stage say, I actually want to change my career track and go somewhere else. 
Uh, some people would do different things, but whatever choices that they make are a little happier for themselves. We also get people through this to confront the world and the reality and the changing context that they find themselves in and say, take accountability. If this is where the world is going, don't sit back and say automation is coming, data is coming. Listen, if, if that means you becoming a little better off at analytic capability, we can help you. We can show you the tools, but take charge. And that's so the future of work and driving purpose in every individual and working with every individual is really the way we think we can try and make a difference. What a nice thing to say and to Alka and everybody else, there are some simple questions that we, you know, that we ask people to think about purpose. Who are the people who matter in your life? <laughs> what are their needs you are inspired to serve? And how can you use your own uniqueness, your own strengths to serve those needs? These are important questions and Nitin is encouraging us to think of purpose in, in, in a comprehensive way. You know, Google Christian, one of our alumni of Soil is asking that uh, Levers is always thinking ahead of its time. So in these difficult times, is there any unique approach that Unilever has sourced recently on how to Leverage your own strengths globally. Is there something unique and new that you need was is trying out currently to really be a step ahead of the crisis? Well, I don't think there is anything. Uh, there's no secret uh, that Unilever has. Unilever has always believed that uh, business is here to serve societal needs. That uh, if we are true, and I keep saying, that uh, in a strange sort of way, business schools have done disservice to business by uh, propagating a mantra that the purpose of business is shareholder wealth maximization. I think that's not the purpose, that is the outcome of running a great business. The purpose of business is to serve societal needs. When you do a good job at your purpose and serving societal needs, society rewards you. And the reward that you get is the profit which you make. So that, that is the outcome, but not the purpose. Over decades, we have got confused between purpose and outcome. And that's why business has got misguided. That's why business is losing trust in society. That's why the Edelman's trust barometer shows how lowly business leaders have been rated and how low the trust is. And it is our job to win back that trust. We genuinely believe the time will come when society simply will not give any business the right to operate if its actions are not overtly socially responsible. And our model is to try and integrate that. And I hope as we do that, we build muscle a little ahead of the rest so that when that situation comes, we are better prepared. But we do that not for any other reason, but because we, we, we believe in it. We yeah, like to do, demonstrate that capitalism can have a different phase. We are unashamed about the fact that we need to be a profitable venture, but yeah. we would be equally ashamed of ourselves if we did it the wrong way. You know, uh, Narendra uh, Paul, who is from the Kinmaya Organization of Rural Development, this organization has transformed the whole of Kangra district by working with the poorest of the poor, by doing microfinance and other things. And he and uh, another uh, colleague here called Arvind Kumar is asking a question. Arvind is asking, how do you teach this entrepreneurial spirit to people in education? And Narendra Paul is also asking, how do you actually enable people to realize the best in a team which is taking on these extraordinary challenges? Is there any particular design of uh, the way this education ought to be? Frankly, uh, I don't know. And uh, if uh, anyone has ideas, I'd only be too happy to learn. Uh, this is a subject that is, uh, uh, well, it's close to everyone. Everyone tries working on it. I have no special answer that I have which could do this. Yes, we have to find a way to change our education to bring this up. Uh, bring more enterprise, figure out how to identify it. At this moment in our company, frankly, we are also struggling with something else and we want to get better at. We know how to measure hard skills in an individual. We don't, we are not so good at being able to measure the softer aspects. 
about their belief system, about the real purpose, about the real drivers. And we are working hard to see how we can get better at that because uh, then you've got the outer game and the inner game, as we call it, coming yeah. together in a powerful sort of way. Thank you. You know, we are unfortunately, as always, short of time. 60 minutes have flown past. So, Nitin, here is what I learned in your presence today. One, be completely honest, including the last answer where you did not pretend to come out with any glib answer that many people in your position might be able to just come out with the gift you have of communication. You didn't you chose not to give that kind of an answer. And you said this is something that we are also trying to learn about. So thank you. There are five other things that I learned from you today, Nitin. One, focus on doing the right thing for people. Fairness always matters. Then, you said that always make your team believe in themselves. You said the purpose of giving feedback is to convert a gap in performance into a learning agenda. And you also said, and you implied, that always give feedback on effort. Do not put down the person because of the ability. Because if you tell something about ability, the person doesn't know what to do. But if you talk about the effort, even the ability can go up. And always at the end of a challenging conversation, to say the person could do more, Always demonstrate you have confidence in the person's ability and capacity to rise to the occasion. What a wonderful thing. You also said that, you know, when you do not achieve something and there is a gap between what you were intending to do and what happened, don't agonize over it. Don't try to be, as you said, too clever in trying to look good. Go back to the first principle and said, what's the right thing to have been done here? If I follow the right thing, the right process, I will in the end get right outcomes. It doesn't matter if between my expectation and the results, there is still a gap. But if as long as I'm in the right path, it will happen. Then you also reminded yourself and all of us, simple, good fashion, middle class values, which you grew up with, saying, even the good guys will win. Do not undervalue yourself. Always believe that those simple values will always make you win in the long run. It doesn't matter if some other people with devious methods go ahead. It doesn't matter. But that is always the best thing. And lastly, Nitin, you said, in all your life, you have never been ahead of yourself and trying to say what you like get out of it. What is the level of ambition or goal? You have immersed yourself. You are 100% in doing what you have been given in your best possible manner. So by being at your personal best, you have created the future. And so I just want to celebrate these wonderful lessons we got from you this evening. And thanks a lot, Nitin, for being. And I just want to say one last thing. You are one of the world's senior most leaders in a big company, in a big role. But anytime I have reached out to you, even for the simplest thing, you have responded almost instantaneously. And that just shows uh, your humility and generosity of spirit. So thanks a lot, Nitin. Thank you very much for being part of our life. For inviting me. It's a privilege and an honor. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And everybody, Next week on the 16th, we will have the wonderful Mr. Ajay Piramal, the chairman of the Piramal group of companies, who also tries to attempt to learn from the Bhagavad Gita and includes lessons from that in his own global company. Look forward to being with you next Thursday. Thank you very much.